people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. In the backdrop of escalating Afghan crisis, 21st Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit was held in Tajikistan's capital Dushanbe. While peace and stability in Afghanistan remain the principal point of discussion, the countries also highlighted the need to enhance bilateral cooperation in order to avoid conflicts in the region. In the backdrop of an unprecedented crisis emerging out of Afghanistan, Shanghai Cooperation Organization marked its 20th founding anniversary in Tajik capital, Dushanbe. The agenda of the latest talks revolved around Afghanistan, where the Taliban swept to power last month. While addressing the summit virtually, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi emphasized on the increasing radicalization, which he said has become the biggest challenge to peace, security and trust deficit in the region. I believe that in this sector, the most important challenges are peace, security and trust deficit. और इन समस्याओं का मूल कारण बढ़ता हुआ रेडिकलाइजेशन है अफगानिस्तान में हाल के घटका घटनाक्रम ने इस चुनौती को और स्पष्ट कर दिया है इंडिया हैज बीन एट द रिसीविंग एंड ऑफ डेकेड्स ऑफ पाकिस्तान बैक्ड टेररिज्म एंड रेडिकलाइजेशन and despite joining the SEO grouping, whose prime objective has been to counter radicalization, Pakistan has only stepped up its nefarious game. It is not just India, but Afghans too have been vociferously criticizing it on several global platforms. Afghans accuse Pakistan of openly supporting violent Taliban means to grab power in their country. SEO leaders also underscored the need to improve bilateral ties among themselves so that peace can prevail in the region. Multiple bilateral and multilateral meetings were held to improve ties among themselves. Indian Foreign Minister unambiguously stated New Delhi's position regarding the Indochina relations. He said the trust and relation could only develop if Beijing was willing to withdraw its troops from the flashpoints near India's Ladakh region. India has maintained that grouping should focus at the prosperity of the region and each member state should strive to achieve that. Bharat Central Asia ke saath apni connectivity badhane ke liye pratibadda hai. Hamara manna hai कि लैंडलॉक्ड सेंट्रल एशियाई देशों को भारत के विशाल बाजार से जुड़कर अपार लाभ हो सकता है। The SEO Pact is a Eurasian political, economic, and security alliance, the creation of which was announced on 15th June 2001 in Shanghai. Originally a five-member grouping, the organization expanded its membership to eight states when India and Pakistan joined SEO as full members on 9th June 2017 at a summit in Astana, Kazakhstan. Iran is the latest entry which experts believe could be beneficial for both SEO and Tehran. Moving on. As violence, poverty and discrimination against women spiral out of control in Afghanistan under Taliban, even the UN has expressed its incapability at bringing things under control. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has said that it would be no less than a fantasy if anyone believed that the world body could prevent an impending Afghan crisis. Taliban have had just one month into the so-called government 
and the instability is already looming large. With promised women rights going up in smoke, the education system facing a Sharia bulldozer and the economy plunging to an unprecedented low, the future of Afghanistan appears bleak. While a large section of the international community has not been able to take a clear stand on the situation, the United Nations believes that it is beyond its capacity to control what is happening in Afghanistan. Asked in an interview a month after the Taliban took control of Afghanistan from a Western-backed government, if he felt pressure to repair the country's plight, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the expectation from the UN body was unfounded. I think there is uh, an expectation that is unfounded. I mean, we have a number of countries that have used hundreds of thousands of soldiers for decades, that have spent trillions uh, for decades. And uh, to think that uh, even if they have failed with all these resources to fix the problems of Afghanistan, the UN can now, without that money, and without those forces, the UN can now solve the problems that they didn't solve for uh, decades is, of course, a fantasy. Meanwhile, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees asked for more support as he described Afghanistan's humanitarian crisis as desperate. During this three-day visit, United Nations' Filippo Grandi was shown around a warehouse filled with relief items. Trucks arrived from Pakistan with tents and other supplies for Afghan families as food and medicine have been scarce. Even before the Taliban took over last month, Grandi said in a written statement, more than 18 million Afghans, or about half the population, required humanitarian aid. More than 3.5 million Afghans were already displaced in a country that is battling drought and the COVID-19 pandemic. In the last few months alone, hundreds of thousands, more than half a million Afghan have been freshly displaced by recent fighting, adding themselves to the millions uh, that were displaced in previous years. Many of them are sleeping out of, in the open. Food is very scarce in the country. Medicines are lacking. The situation from the humanitarian point of view is pretty desperate. International donors have pledged to assist the country with over a billion dollars, but that does not seem enough for a country of 36 million people. And with no foreign aid at the moment, the situation is getting worse. Even those migrants who have been living in Pakistan and support Taliban rule are pessimistic about returning to their homeland. They believe the economic situation is not returning to anything near normal in the immediate future. Meanwhile, the elephant in the room, the situation of women in the country has taken a back seat with not much being talked about the principal argument and the promise around the women during the peace talks. They have been immediately subjected to the previous draconian Sharia law. Even the renowned and successful football team are forced to leave in such a scenario, let alone the commoners who are living hundreds of kilometers away from the capital in far-flung areas where neither the media has reached nor it is likely to reach. They, however, have shown resistance this time around, some of them via social media, while others oppose the brutes on the streets right in front of them. Pakistan's diabolic agenda vis-a-vis -vis Balochistan is getting more vicious by the day. While earlier, intimidation and illegal detentions were the predominant tools employed by the Pakistan establishment to silence Baloch dissent, their barbaric designs have gone a step further. Targeted killings is the new mode of operation. Exiled Balochs in Europe highlighted the issue in a recently held anti-Pak demonstration in Germany. 
a number of activists from the Free Balochistan movement held a protest rally in Germany's Hanover city against the quake encounters by Pakistani forces in Balochistan. The protesters blamed that Pakistan has continued to pursue its infamous kill and dump policy and its counter-terrorism department or CTD has been forcibly disappearing innocent Baloch people before killing them in state encounters in the name of counter-terrorism operations. The protesters highlighted torture, human rights abuses and illegal occupation of Balochistan by Pakistan. They urged the international community to intervene immediately to stop the ongoing Baloch genocide. We are neither tired of raising our voice, nor we are hopeless. But UNO and other powering bodies should now accept their ignorance towards us and should act before it's too late. In past few weeks, dozens of Baloch youths have been killed in the name of defending the state from terrorism. But heart-wrenching stories from their family members and neighbours point towards a completely different picture of systematic state attempts at muzzling the voice of dissent. They abduct Baloch youth, torture them and kill them with impunity. In two separate incidents previous month, the CTD killed 12 Baloch youths and labelled them as terrorists. And these gross incidents of atrocities have been painted by Pakistani media as agencies' victory against terrorism. Exiled Baloch, who have already been struggling for human rights of people of resource-rich province of Balochistan, want international forces to intervene in Baloch issue before Pakistan launches its plan of Baloch ethnic cleansing to accommodate its own interests and ambitions. Only in August 2021, CTD itself claimed killing of 20 individuals in two different incidents. No evidence of the target individuals being involved in any kind of violence or firefight have been provided by the CTD. Activists have long accused that the Pakistan army and spy agencies have been carrying out so-called military operations in the region for years with an aim to eliminate the Baloch people. They blame thousands have been internally displaced because of army operations over the years. The data collated by Baloch organizations say more than 53,000 have been abducted over the years. The list also includes Baloch women and children. The Baloch descent and Pakistan's subsequent offensive against them ratcheted up sharply in the wake of Islamabad signing a multi-billion dollar deal with its so-called all-weather friend, China. For the indigenous Baloch people, the CPEC is seen as a threat. If the CPEC gets implemented in Balochistan, there will be a massive inflow of migrants from different areas of Pakistan which will change the demography of Balochistan and reduce the Baloch people to a permanent minority in their historic homeland. This is exactly what Pakistan wants, to reduce them to a number where their voice cannot reach anyone. While CPEC could have been accommodated by Balochs, Pakistan's discriminatory policy of not sharing even what they exploit from Balochistan with locals has already exposed its agenda. And this is what has led to Balochs' undying demand for termination of CPEC and restoration of their rights, which Pakistan government has cracked upon through various techniques, including the latest one of targeted killings. And now in our section of Asia this week, the stories from across the continent that hit the headlines this week.
साउथ कोरिया सक्सेसफुली टेस्टेड अ सबमरीन लॉन्च्ड बैलिस्टिक मिसाइल और एस एल बी एम एज इट एम्स टू एनहेंस इट्स काउंटर टू नॉर्थ कोरिया ग्रोइंग कैपेबिलिटीज साउथ कोरिया मिसाइल टेस्ट केम दी सेम डे एज नॉर्थ कोरिया फायर अ पेयर ऑफ बैलिस्टिक मिसाइल्स ऑफ इस्ट ईस्ट कोस्ट ब्रीचिंग यू एन सेंक्शन एंड रेचिटिंग ऑफ टेंशन जस्ट डेज आफ्टर टेस्टिंग अ क्रूज मिसाइल विद पॉसिबल न्यूक्लियर कैपेबिलिटीज President Moon Jae-in attended an underwater ejection test of the SLBM aboard the new 3000-ton class Dosan and Changho submarine commissioned last month. Moon said the SLBM test had been planned and was not in response to the North Korea's launches. He also cited the nuclear armed North's asymmetric capabilities as a reason for South Korea to develop better missiles. The test would make South Korea the first country without nuclear weapons to develop such a system. A plane carrying a group of Malaysian tourists was greeted with a water salute after touching down at the airport of Holiday Hotspot Langkawi Island as it reopened to fully vaccinated domestic travelers this week. Earlier this month the Malaysian government announced Langkawi would be the first tourist site to reopen as part of a domestic tourism bubble with strict protocols in place to thwart the spread of the coronavirus. The plan is similar to that introduced in Thailand. which started with the July reopening of Phuket which is 220 kilometers north of Langkawi to vaccinated foreign tourists the Malaysia however has not noted to the entry of the foreign tourists a bamboo forest called Chikurin no Mishi In Arashiyama district of Kyoto is one of the most iconic sceneries in Japan. It attracts thousands of tourists every year. Pictures of this bamboo forest are certain to be found on any website or tourist pamphlet for Kyoto because the beauty of this place captures the heart of tourists. Many tourists donned in traditional Japanese outfit visit this place to get a unique experience. にはない京都の良さだと思いますね。あの京都で建物高かっちゃいけないんですけど、ここめっちゃ高さあって、京都の中でもとても素敵な場所だと思いますね。はい。The forest of giant bamboo extends more than a kilometer. The fence on the site is also made of bamboo. Many of the bamboo here reach up to 25 meters. and with a diameter up to 25 cm visitors can hire rickshaw called jin rickshaw in japanese to enjoy guided tours through the narrow path in the bamboo forest the forest is open 24 hours a day and there is no entry fee it takes only 15 minutes train ride from kyoto station so no one should miss visiting this magical place Japan is a country with a strong environment protection policy. The government promises zero carbon emission by 2050. To achieve this, many companies and sectors are encouraged to step up their effort to use environment friendly materials including construction. One of such promising materials is a volcanic rock that is found in abundance in Japan. And the country is volcanically active land. Even its natural symbol Mount Fuji is actually a volcano. This company in Tokyo is promoting the use of volcanic rock to cover surface of building walls, bridges and road side. The idea in the beginning was to make cosmetic effect to make building blend with the surrounding natural scenery, but later moss and plant started growing out of porous surface of the volcanic rock. シダは富士山が綺麗と同時に溶岩がたくさんあったんですね。で庭に溶岩がたくさんあって庭の溶岩に植物がついてるってことが一番よく子供の時からしてたんで。で多幸質じゃなきゃ溶岩であっても意味がないなっていう。多幸質な環境のある溶岩。その穴には生き物や昆虫や緑化もできる穴がたくさん空いてると。その石を特徴としさせてあのアイディアとしていろんな形の商品を考えてきてるんですね。
natural volcanic rock can be used in different size and shape, even cut into thin board of concrete with embedded volcanic rock that can be attached to the exterior of already existing surface. Another material which does not contain concrete is super thin, ultra lightweight material which can be cut to any size and attached even to curved surface of different shape. The environment friendly feature of volcanic rock makes it suitable to reviving the ecosystem of the urban areas when used as a construction material. Moving on. Hindu devotees across India celebrated the 10-day long Ganesh Chaturthi festival which commemorates the birth anniversary of the Hindu elephant-headed god Lord Ganesha. According to Hindu religion, Ganesha is the Hindu deity of prosperity and remover of obstacles. Let's take a glance at this colorful celebration amid the coronavirus restrictions. Devotees across India welcome the Hindu elephant-headed god with great fervor and enthusiasm as they mark the auspicious festival of Ganesh Chaturthi by taking his idol to their respective homes and community pandals in huge processions in a majestic manner. Considered to be the deity of prosperity and remover of hurdles by Hindus, Lord Ganesha's birth celebrations go on for 10 days. In Hinduism, Lord Ganesha is worshipped first while doing anything auspicious in homes or places of business. Like last year, the pandemic yet again put a halt to a large-scale festivities in many parts of the country, including in Maharashtra, where the festival is marked in an extravagant manner. Several other temples of the state allowed a few devotees and asked the rest to do online darshan. Today's day is Ganesh Ji's birthday. It is the biggest thing in Hindu samskar. This year, because of COVID-19, we can't do this every year. We can't do this every year. But the people who are in the temple, 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 the people Lord Ganesha is popularly worshipped under different names like Ekdand, Kapila, Gajakarna, Lambodara, Vinayak, Bhalchand and Gajanan. During the celebrations, devotees welcome Ganesha idols at their homes and offer prayers and perform various rituals. They also go marquee hopping with their friends and families, offering prayers and eating modaks, a traditional sweet dumpling made with wheat and rice flour mixed with coconut and jaggery, believed to be a favorite of Lord Ganesha. हम लोग पिछले पांच साल से बिठा रहे हैं। मुझे इस बार अनेस मौसम में ऐसा सोचा कि कुछ something different किया जाए तो मेरे मैंने सोचा क्यों नहीं इस बार हम एपर कप्स, मिरर वर्क से कुछ अलग बनाया जाए। in various cities of India, devotees gathered and prayed outside closed temples to pay obeisance to Lord Ganesha, the deity of prosperity, while only priests conducted prayers inside. Bollywood too joined the celebrations and beat town actors and actresses called for an eco-friendly celebration of the festival. Lord Ganesha is considered the embodiment of wisdom and is widely revered as the remover of obstacles. During the festival, elaborately painted and decorated idols are worshipped before mass processions take them to nearby rivers, lakes and the sea, where they are immersed in accordance with Hindu faith. On the 10th and the last day of the festival, the idols are immersed in water bodies. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.